beyond imagination unless it is experienced its sights and sounds are unfathomable scenes that puzzle and perplex yet amaze and enthrall saints whose presence can't be felt anywhere else an ocean of emotions you never witnessed an unknown mystical world where spirituality reigns supreme an epitome of hospitality that beckons all drawing 50 million people from all corners of this vast land a treasure of plurality of language of cultures of communities each so varied and so distinct amidst the diversity an underlying unity a collective quest for truth and countless paths leading up to it this is the kumbh mela the world's largest grandest most spectacular event this is the kumbh mela a window to the heart of india the kumbh is a celebration of bliss a wonderful opportunity to rise above the pain and suffering a rare moment to embrace divinity and participate in the festivity of human existence kumbh mela is a confluence of sages and ascetics without any formal invitations these saints converge at the mela site under the flags of their respective akharas and sects the kumbh mela beckons to them and they respond emerging from their distant abodes in jungles caves or mountains the wanderers too turn their steps towards the kumbh mela the purpose of the mela traditionally is for sadhus to get together um sadhus that are spread around the country that have very little contact with each other this is remember this is prior to cell phones and and all of these things they had very little way of getting to when i first the first mela that i attended was the article mela in 1971 in priyag and many of the sadhus there people had not seen for years they were living in the jungle they were living in caves they were living in the himalayas doing their tapasya but they knew that when the mela happened they would get together as family gathering the these the 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 sampradayas are really families and so the mela is important for these family gathering kumbh is a world renowned for its magnificence and grandeur even more astounding is the beautiful diversity that it encompasses from south to north east to west from ganga to kaveri himalaya to sahyatri streams of spirituality wisdom and awareness merge in this divine kumbh mela the entire country manifests itself in the kumbh which can be termed a national herald in many ways kumbh denotes the essence of india It flows through the very core of Indian way of life, reaffirming and revitalizing it. It would not be an exaggeration to term it as the driving force behind Sanatan Dharma. Kumbh Mela is the highest expression through which a nation celebrates its civilizational continuity. Kumbh is a rare moment when the sages ascetics and spiritual masters from every corner of india reach householders while normally devotees make difficult journeys to get blessings of great sages in kumbh the sages come themselves to impart blessings 
All over the Kumbh, the sages meditate, hold sacred discussions about how to attain ultimate knowledge and the divine nectar overflows. The divine nectar for which sadhaks rush from across the globe. Thirty-six years ago, I wanted to go to Australia and stop over in India. And by chance, I landed up at the Alta Kumbh in Hatwa. There was a full Kumbh in Ujjain at that time. And I had no idea at all what it was. And I met two saints which impressed, who impressed me so much that now, 36 years later, I'm still in India. The Kumbh is a golden opportunity to glimpse into the soul of India, to comprehend Sanatan Dharma. A journey into understanding Kumbh is a journey into unraveling the mystery that is India. A peep into the mystical Kumbh is an attempt to demystify India. To understand India, one has to understand the essence of Sanatan Dharma and viewing Sanatan Dharma through the looking glass of the Kumbh can make it simpler. Understanding the Kumbh can pave the path to understanding India for Kumbh is India itself. It's inspiring. Just between the little old ladies and you know, people have these little compounds and these babas have this compound and someone everywhere you're walking down, someone's teaching here, someone's teaching there. So this very vibrant, alive situation. It's not just people going to the river and bathing and coming back. There's something going on everywhere. And this compound feeds a thousand people a day and that compound feeds 2000 people a day. And over here, this one doesn't feed anybody, but there's lectures going on. And, and this one's really rich and fancy. This one's just a poor little place, you know, I mean, side by side. And um, that's an interesting thing to see is the diversity and the intensity. It's like one of the most intense experiences on earth, I think, you know, the, the Kumbh Mela. The presence of countless sages, saints and monks imbues the atmosphere of the Mela with a purity that is impossible to experience elsewhere. Kumbh Mela, in its true sense, denotes an invocation to the collective conscience. Kumbh is a celebration of awareness, a Mahayagya for cosmic well-being. On the banks of the Mela flow sacred rivers and among the multitudes of their banks flow sentiments that elevate humanity to a higher plane. Kumbh is organized at four places on the banks of sacred rivers in the north at Haridwar and in the east at Prayag on the banks of the river Ganga. Ujjain in the west hosts the Kumbh on the banks of river Shipra while in the south, it is the Godavari, whose banks at Nasik are the venue for the grand event. Rivers have always been revered in Sanatan Dharma. River banks have traditionally been venues for organizing religious festivities. In fact, many pilgrimage sites called Tirth are located on the banks of rivers. Tirth means that place that transports or takes one across the symbolic river of life. In doing so, one is set free from worldly bondages. Kumbh by virtue of being held on river banks becomes the locus of attaining liberation. On an average, the Mela is held every three years across four different locations. Hence, each location becomes the chosen location after a span of 12 years. Once the location is declared, a temporary township emerges there almost out of thin air ready to house the surging crowds that would descend there during the month-long fair. The Kumbh Township is a mobile citadel that moves from one location to another, taking within its folds the devout, whose numbers keep growing with every passing year. Traditionally, the Kumbh Mela has been the prerogative of Akaras, that is, special sects, to which sages and saints bear allegiance. Nearly all of the designated 13 Akharas trace their origins to Adi Shankaracharya. Each Akhara is distinct in its philosophy, practices of worship, choice of chief deity, etc. 
In spite of this diversity, all Akharas subscribe to a common mission, the upholding and propagation of Sanatan Dharma. They're coming together at the Kumbh Mela bears testimony to this common purpose. It can intrigue an external observer that without any central authority, publicity or formal invitation, how millions come together at the Kumbh Mela on specific date and place. Even more magical is the fact that they spend an entire month together in peaceful coexistence without conflict or discord and sharing their knowledge, experience and worldview with each other. After completion of the Kumbh, they return to their native places blissfully with adding treasure of knowledge, austerity and spirituality with them. This shows the sacred and historical significance of the Kumbh Mela and also the unflinching devotion of the devotees of Sanatan Dharma. But what is the origin of the Kumbh Mela? When did this huge event first make its presence felt in the Indian mainland? How did it become one of the torch bearers of Sanatan Dharma in this huge nation? Kumbh Mela is something that uh, is very ancient in India, has no beginning. Therefore, there's no history of when it started because it's since the beginning of times. In Western religions, there is always history. There's always a particular beginning and event happened. And so certain things that they believe have a time and date when it happened. And before that, the same, the same truth or the same knowledge of God or the same instructions were not there. So there's a arrival of Jesus in one case or God is given, he gives Moses the Ten Commandments and then the arrival of Muhammad, you know, he gets the, Allah speaks to him. So in our case, something like the Kumbh Mela is beginningless. There is no one event in history that when it, uh, from which it starts. That's a very important point. Second thing is that the Kumbh Mela is an enactment Reenactment over and over again of of the of the original uh, you know how things start the whole idea of creation or the whole idea of manifestation uh, that is enacted now in in uh, Christianity and Islam and so on they enact social events public uh, political events but there's no philosophical metaphysical cosmological event as such being enacted by them it's so difficult for them to understand because there is no parallel to this in their own history. The first documented reference to the Kumbh Mela can be found in a 6th century treatise. Renowned world traveler and chronicler Hyun Sang documents his visit to the city of Prayag. Sang mentions a massive congregation of humans on the banks of the Ganga every six years. During the event, the ruler King Harshwardhan would give away his all in charity returning to his place in only the clothes that covered him. It's fairly probable that the event referred to here is the Ardhkumbh, held every six years at Prayag. The timing and venue of Kumbh Mela is determined on the basis of astronomical events. It is believed that during these planetary alignments, spiritual energy is at its peak, making Kumbh Mela a truly divine event. Calculations are made by studying the position of three celestial bodies, the Sun, Moon and Jupiter in different Rashis or zodiac signs. These astrological phenomena are deeply symbolic. The three celestial bodies have profound spiritual and physical associations. In Sanatan Dharma, Sun symbolizes the Atma, Moon the Man and Jupiter the Dharma. When Dharma is practiced, it purifies the chit or man, which in turn elevates the soul and opens the door for self-realization. It is the main cause which attracts sadhak to the Kumbh Mela from all over the world. Among the many mythological tales associated with the Kumbh Mela, the most popular is the ancient legend of the Samudra Manthan. Once, Lord Vishnu decreed the churning of the celestial ocean for obtaining Amrit or the nectar of life. Both Devtas and Dhanavs were to participate in this arduous task and were to get a portion of this juice of immortality. Considering the legendary animosity between these agents of good and bad, a conflict broke out between them on the division of Amrit. 
In the ensuing conflict, a few drops fell out of the comb or pitcher over four places on earth. Later, these sites became the venues for the Kumbh Mela. In the Sanatan tradition, folklore has deep educational connotations. It presents profound and esoteric truths in simple and interesting tales for the uptake by common masses. Samudra Manthan or churning of ocean is the manthan that must take place within each individual uh, between the uh, between the asuric or the materialistic forces within oneself, which makes one think that one is only the body, and the divic or the divine elements within oneself. Uh, and it's through that churning which involves suffering and tapas uh, that extraordinary uh, vibhutis are generated, uh, which become a part of oneself and which it's these vibhutis which helps a person go beyond who one was and becomes a new being. So it's really about regeneration and uh, being connected with uh, immortality. Kumbh Mela is a rare opportunity to understand the tradition of saints and sages of India. They are the flag bearers of India's spiritual legacy. Their unceasing penance has ensured the committance of this legacy and the establishment of dharma. That is why, in Sanatan Dharma, they are treated as the highest authority in society. We don't have such people in the West. It's only in India where you can meet such great people who are who have done sadhana, who have purified themselves to a great extent. These great men may look different on the outside, but essentially they are similar in the core values they uphold. They are all seekers of truth. Under the tutelage of these saints at the Kumbh Mela, ordinary men can find answers to the questions that have been plaguing them and a deeper synthesis with their wisdom could show the path to a meaningful life. These mystics are India's spiritual heroes, exerting a deep influence on the mind and psyche of India's millions. The saints willingly abdicate the charm of material world and dedicate themselves to the pursuit of self-evolution. This is a beautiful and pragmatic rendition of the microcosm in its journey towards the macrocosm. When the upholders of the Sant Parampara congregate at the Kumbh Mela, it truly becomes a site of great relevance and indeed boundless reverence. Um, we all want to be happy and money is not going to give us happiness. A sense of meaning in life will give us happiness. And sadhus have methods to practice. They have sadhana. That's sadhunam sadhana hai. Right? The purpose of being a sadhu is to do sadhana, to find inner peace and at the same time to help others to find that inner peace. In our sampradai, there are basically four things that you do. You do Ram Nam, you spread Ram Nam. You eat and you spread food. Right? Bhajan Bhojan. <laughs> Those are the things. You take it, you do it yourself and you spread it with for others. Do. The Kumbh Mela is essentially a fair of saints and ascetics. It is also a rare opportunity for the householder to witness great sages and gather invaluable education about what constitutes right and wrong, dharma and adharma. Many saints visiting the Kumbh Mela are those who have never set foot in organized society. They shun all social interaction, spending days, months and even years in uninhabited lands and far-off caves, in deep meditation and penance. Kumbh Mela is where the Indian gurus concentrate their energy and guidance to direct to the human world, taking all their knowledge from the higher planes of consciousness in the inner worlds and taking it down where they can share it with all humanity. So it is the sharing of India's wisdom, not only with the people of India, but with the world as a whole. Traditionally, Kumbh Mela offers an opportunity for debate, 
discourse and dialogue amongst the sages of different sects of Sanatan Dharma. The nectar that emanates from this intellectual churning enriches the spiritual, social and cultural environment of society. Kumbh Mela is a unique amalgamation of three varied traditions. The Shastra tradition, the tradition of sadhana or meditation and the household tradition. It is the beauty of Indian society that each of them maintained the decorum and grace of the other two. At Kumbh, one can also witness that how different systems of governance, political, dharmic or social, do not control but strengthen each other. This mutual management becomes the foundation of an ideal society. Sanatan tradition is a tradition of spirituality. Despite of all physical comfort and prosperity, man has always been plagued by the existential quest, the eternal question of the self. Who am I? What is the truth? As these questions plague the psyche, one rushes to the Kumbh Mela to seek answers. Uh, Sanatan Dharma is the path of questioning of the questioning of the deepest kind, uh, which allows you to go beyond, which is something that uh, traditional science cannot do because each traditional scientific discipline is a framework for a specific limited study. And all that you can do is to reproduce the results uh, related to those systems. Uh, and if you are a um, major scientist in that particular field as a chemist or a physicist, then you can push at the boundaries. And of course, you are uh, praised for having done that. But it doesn't take you anywhere close to the mystery, which is uh, the very heart of consciousness. And of course, uh, more and more scientists are talking about it, not only scientists, but also artists and other seekers. And therefore, it appears to me that the world has truly come very close to understanding the spring wells of um, uh, Sanatan Dharma spirituality. And this Kumbh Mela is a perfect stepping stone uh, and uh, the ones that will follow where more and more people from all over the world, especially now when the West is facing an amazing crisis, both in Europe and the United States um, and in uh, Latin America. And therefore, this is really the point. I think in that sense, uh, this Sinkhastha is a historical moment. They throng to the Kumbh Mela, but it would be wrong to call them tourists. They are Tirth Yatris in the true sense of the word. Tirthatan is an amazing innovation of Sanatan Dharma. Tourists and pilgrims are different. True, both undertake journeys, but the similarity ends here. Unlike tourists, Tirthyatris don't seek adventure, excitement or mesmeric sights. Their journey is deeper, an inner movement, a movement to get answers to life's perplexing questions. It is an all-encompassing journey, from the stated to the unstated, from the cross to the subtle, from the manifest to unmanifest. Kumbh Mela offers countless opportunities for spiritual elevation. Here devotees come across to many saints and sages. It's also a time where villagers have an opportunity to meet the sadhus, so that the sadhus can then um, they can interact with the sadhus, they can hopefully get some teachings, they can hopefully um, uh, find inspiration, maybe find a guru. Um, this has been a part of the ancient tradition in many villages. Uh, the cultural traditions in many of the areas, one it was important for one to have a guru. And so where would you find, you know, it's like if you're going shopping for a guru, <laughs> the best place to do it is at a kumbha mela. So this is one of the very important, the gathering of sadhus and then the interaction between sadhus and householders. In Sanatan Dharma, search for truth is a noble quest and all are free to choose any path in that direction. Sanatan Dharma is not a controlling or restrictive faith, but a liberating one. 
it bestows upon its believers the freedom of choice, be that of the Guru or scripture or deity. The seeker can undertake the study of the Shastras, meditate or become follower of seers and wise men. The ways are myriad and the choice free. This is the peculiarity of Sanatan Dharma. One is not forced to believe the so-called absolute truth written in any holy book. Sanatan Dharma offers opportunity to every individual for exploration of truth. It is always advised by reading the scriptures, blessing of sages and practicing the meditation. Every individual can explore the truth and attain self-realization. Kumbh Mela is a celebration of individual choice which allows the natural unfoldment of a human being. The sages and devotees that come here follow different sects, worship different gods, read different texts and follow different paths to self-realization. Yet, it is strange that this bewildering diversity does not discomfort anyone here. It is in stark contrast to what we see around world today. A world that is becoming progressively intolerant to plurality, where stringent, sometimes violent means are adopted to force humanity to subscribe to one monotheistic faith, belief or world view. Sanatan Dharma maintains that God is consciousness which is all-pervasive and manifests itself in myriad ways. Even laymen in India understand this. India as a country is unique in the world that it has allowed the full freedom of exploration of religion, spirituality, science, art and consciousness all together. And this tremendous diversity then comes back as a mutual sharing and respect for every unique individual and every unique point of view. So this ability to embrace the great freedom of life in a higher unity of awareness is manifested through the Kum. Probably this is why Indian society is so astoundingly diverse, be it language, food, faith, practices or belief system. Yet, this diversity is bound together by an underlying unity. It is very important to understand that it is not only unity in diversity, but an underlying unity, which allows and makes it plural, manifest in diverse expressions. This unity is not artificial or enforced by an institution, but is inherent. Due to the underlying unity of Sanatan Dharma, the external diversities flourish without inhibitions or clashes. In Hinduism, there is great respect for diversity and no place for strife or conflict. This belief makes word such as religious conversion untainable to believers of Hinduism. It is really amazing that not a single event of conflict or violence happens at Kumbh between various sects of Sanatan Dharma. In Sanatan Dharma, there is no attempt to make anyone subscribe to a single scripture, faith or God. It salutes the diversity in creation, just as it celebrates the diversity in each individual. Such a deep understanding of the diversity in creation gives Hinduism a truly egalitarian outlook. Hinduism celebrates plurality, making it democratic in every sense. This outlook bestows upon the Hindu the tolerant eye to discern the same consciousness in the plurality of the world. Kumbh, in a true sense, is a celebration of diversity. Kumbh Mela brings in many gurus and many teachings and many sadhus, so it's quite a variety and Western people are used to a very stereotyped spirituality and it's hard for them to understand the great diversity of the Kumbh. At the Kumbh, we can witness yet another defining uniqueness of Hinduism. 
it perceives divinity in every particle of creation. In nature, every speck cuddles within itself, a spark of this divinity. No wonder then that the Hindu worships nature. In Kumbh, it is very obvious that millions of people bow before trees, rivers and forces of nature with the same reverence they bow before gods, scriptures and sages. The world today is facing severe ecological imbalance. But it can learn reverence for nature from Sanatan Dharma, especially through Kumbh. Hinduism's worldview of recognizing a pervasive consciousness is not merely a dharmic practice. It is a belief system with deep understanding of life and its preservation. It is obvious that Hindu feels obsessive need to forge a relationship with nature. The Hindus see the maternal figure in a cow or a river or a tulsi plant. Trees and mountains are believed as protectors. Serpents are worshipped as deities. In fact, a monkey or a cat invokes familial associations such as uncle or auntie. This is neither coincidence nor superstition. It bears testimony to Hinduism's subordination to Mother Nature and heeding to her mighty assertions. In doing so, the Hindu vows to protect and preserve her. For a Hindu, it is not important who he is worshipping, but what is really important is the understanding that every creation of nature is divine and thus eligible for worship. The issue of sanctity becomes very important because in the West, sanctity is really limited. What is sacred? Right? What is sacred is determined, predetermined by the rulers, the religious leaders. In Islam, it's the mullahs or the clerics. In Christianity, it's the priests or the reverends. In Judaism, it's the rabbis. They determine what is sacred. Within the Hindu tradition, sanctity is much more prevalent. You can create a sacred space. I can create a sacred space. This is not something that Westerners understand. And so to see this idea of a sacred river, a sacred tree, a sacred stone, totally outside the context of thinking. And for them, many of them, it is seen as negative. This founding principle of Sanatan Dharma has ensured that this ancient civilization continues to thrive without conflict with nature. Both coexist in harmony, maintaining a balance that promotes growth and development. Sanatan Dharma maintains that every speck in nature is a manifestation of consciousness and humans are but a part of the integrate pattern that nature weaves Hence, humans can never be conquerors or controllers of nature. This humility makes Sanatan Dharma truly egalitarian. The Kumbh Mela is a reflection of this generosity of vision, a vision that suffuses every Hindu's outlook. He proclaims that nature is not to be subverted or exploited. Its preservation and upkeep is my duty for I am but a part of it. The Kumbh Mela also reflects that the feminine principle has been regarded with the deepest reverence in Hinduism. In fact, the place of preeminence that the feminine holds here is difficult to find in any other civilization. Devi or goddess worship and Shakti or energy worship is widespread in Hinduism. All pursuits esoteric or worldly, have an element of the feminine enshrined in them. Be in the arts, music, mantras or meditation, Hinduism perceives the female force in everything and bows before it in gratitude and supplication. This veneration of the goddess percolates down to the daily life of the Hindus too. Women are accorded a special place in society. When I met Ananda Mama, it, so many people came to her and men and women, they bow to her. And it made me think, no? I mean, she's a woman and uh, big men, even, uh, yeah, 
politicians, whoever, they would come and, and bow to her. And then they keep saying that the status of women in India is not good. I mean, this is something very, very strange. In ancient time, it was there. And then the goddess worship is there. This great Brahman, he manifests in so many forms. And he manifests also in female forms. And so this, this worship is, is present in India. And it makes a whole culture more, maybe more feminine even, more gentle. This acknowledgement of woman power may not be apparent to the Western philosophers or social scientists, for it goes much beyond their interpretation of gender equality. At the Kumbh Mela, bathing in the holy waters of rivers holds deep significance. In Sanatan tradition, rivers are life-giving and are worshipped as worldly manifestations of the goddess. Sanatan Dharma extols the maternal aspect of rivers and considers a dip in their waters as purifying and elevating. It also maintains a sense of duty towards the rivers for their preservation. At one level, this cleanses the body and soul of ills, and at another level, reaffirms the Hindu's duty to keep rivers clean and preserve their life-giving energy. They don't have also the idea of the sacredness of, of a river. There, there are no sacred rivers uh, in the Western religious traditions. Um, in India, all the rivers are sacred. On prescribed dates during the Kumbh Mela, special bathing rituals are held on the ghats or banks of holy rivers. These are called Shahi or Amrit Snan and are undoubtedly the most spectacular and anticipated events during the Mela. Sages and monks gather at the ghats for a holy dip, giving the devotees a rare and precious opportunity to see them up close. Naga sadhus or naked ascetics whose only covering is ash or bhasma hold out a message to the onlookers. Everything is prey to the scourge of time and ultimately will return to ashes. After the bathing of sages, it is auspicious to take bath in the holy water. In India, knowledge has always been revered, but the quest to acquire knowledge has never been limited to physical prosperity. Here, quest for knowledge is deeper and multidimensional. It offers solution to every aspect of life, whether physical, social, cultural or spiritual. The Kumbh Mela is a great opportunity to enrich this age-long knowledge tradition. Indian uh, tradition was about, um, about satsang and about shastrat, right? Where people with different views came together and talked and argued uh, and related their experiences, which is uh, one of the things that was done at the congregation of the Kumbh Mela. So, this is a system of conference uh, of an extraordinary kind. So you're not just meeting with uh, one group of 10 or 20 or 50 people, but you can go and uh, talk, to, um, uh, talk to Munis and others and Rishis and even lay persons uh, over a period of a month if you're spending the entire month or a shorter period. Here. Yeah. Scholars of different schools of thought and philosophies share their knowledge with the masses. The ordinary people get to understand numerous opinions on knowledge. They have the freedom to decide, choose and adopt any path that they wish. This phenomenon makes Sanatan Dharma truly democratic. Sanatan Dharma innovated the most popular and effective method of communicating the deeper knowledge to the masses, the Katha Pravachan Parampara. It is the traditional way of teaching through storytelling. Deep mysteries and profound principles are communicated to the masses through the medium of tales and anecdotes, thus aiding easy comprehension. Indian knowledge has been disseminated and transferred from generation to generation through the narrative mode, narrative mode, the Katha Sarita Sagar, you know, the, the ocean of a thousand stories. During the Kumbh, almost all different sects, 
akharas and gurus organize katha pravachan for masses at large the influence of these tales is deep and pervasive the average hindu draws inspiration from them establishes personal standards of right and wrong thus his conduct his choices his decisions are tempered by the learning he has gathered through these pravachans in kumbh mela you can easily find thousands of common people who will share their deepest knowledge or profound principles of dharma in normal chit chat my own memory of the first kumbh that i attended 1950 i was i think 9 year old boy at that time i it was in haridwar and i went around in the morning i would go around after bath i'll go around and one in the in one pandal somebody will be narrating the story of mahabharat i will sit for some time then go to the other person narrating mahabharat and then i will choose this is the best and then you know that is how i learned my mahabharat mahabharat the katha pravachan parampara has uh, has uh, been responsible for making knowledge knowledge esoteric knowledge democratic and vernacular in india democratic and vernacular the it has the it has reached the knowledge has reached the masses irrespective of any social cultural or any other distinctions which our education system does not ensure today but katha pravachan in the oral tradition the beauty is that when you speak anyone who has ears can hear you and understand he doesn't need the reading ability he doesn't need the writing ability you know he can understand you so katha pravachan has been responsible for the for the sedimentation of knowledge in the indian people it is the success of katha pravachan parampara that indian society has maintained its wisdom for thousands of years it's the excellence and competence of kathakars or storytellers who transmitted deep knowledge of shastras to the life of common people the philosophy is so profound and even normal people understand what consciousness means chitanya i was once in a in a village and there was a lady saint karuna mai and a bus of full of villagers came she was talking uh shri lalita it was a lalita temple um chitanya rupa lalita is in the form of chitanya and i thought you can tell this in india to simple villagers but if you tell it in the west to academic uh, academics they will have a blank stare and wonder what is this um, consciousness <laughs> when transmuted into music these sermons acquire a lyrical quality becoming bhajans or kirtans poetic expressions of truth set to music often as choral singing they elevate participants to another plane one can only marvel at the artistry of the storytellers who could so beautifully bind dharma knowledge and truth into simple stories for general consumption and mass communication bhajan and kirtan are gurgling perennial streams of spirituality that flows through sanatan dharma once bathed in their cleansing waters all ego and self-centeredness is washed away humans rise revitalized and ready to commune with eternity from ages the kumbh mela has been a platform for free and open discussion without discord with due reverence for all there is interaction of people of varying opinions and world view with the common objective of arriving at the truth in the west there hasn't been a tradition of discussion debate open mindedness because you know god speaks you listen you obey that's the end of the story there's no discussion and there's no such thing as krishna and arjuna having a discussion and debate i mean we have this all the time ram is having discussions with people so for us it is quite okay that you know you even argue back to god you know avatar 
but in the west it's sort of one way that's it so the obedience based kind of a system and therefore we could safely say that there is a deeper tradition of intellectualism of curiosity of of creativity in our system uh, than in the west where it is more based on compliance with rules that have been fixed for you this this is the, uh, therefore the vibrancy of intellectualism and the diversity of ideas that people have is okay and encouraged in our system many terms and phraseologies that today have become the common parlance of the intellectual of the modern world have defined sanatan dharma since ages looking to this age long tradition of sanatan dharma contemporary focus on freedom of expression open discourse mutual respect and tolerance seems to be very superficial there is plenty for the seeker at the kumbh mela it is a literary fountain head it is an opportunity to learn about the literary traditions of numerous schools of thought of appreciating diverse means of acquiring knowledge of study of growth many organizations set up exhibitions showcasing india's glorious history of truth seeking from days of yore to the present day in many ways the kumbh mela also provides an insight into the depth interconnectivity and strength of the social fabric of india as obvious by its sheer size management of the mela is a herculean task the responsibility of boarding lodging feeding transporting the millions who will visit the hallowed grounds is a miniature picture of management at the kumb this responsibility is shared by the administration and the society at the designated location every member of the society contributes be it a child an adult or an elderly people from every walk of life come forth to do their bit in making the event a thumping success be it a villager or a city dweller a labor farmer or businessman an employee or a student everyone contributes according to their capacity manoj tiwari mera naam hai aur main mpd se hu assistant engineer mechanical engineer se aur main chutti lekar ke yahan kumbh mein apni jal ki sevaye dene aaya hu santo aur bhakto ke jhoote bartan dhona to bahut punya ka karya hai इस इस कार्य के लिए हमारे घर में बहुत से कर्मचारी हैं पर कुंभ के मेले में हम यहाँ सिर्फ सेवा देने आए हैं इट इज एन अमेजिंग एक्सपीरियंस दैट ड्यूरिंग द कुंभ इंटायर सिटी टर्न्स होस्ट फेसेस वी स्माइल्स एंड हॉस्पिटैलिटी बिकम्स धर्मा इनविटेशन आर डिस्पैच टू फ्रेंड्स एंड रिलेटिव मंथ्स बिफोर द इवेंट इन हैप्पी एंटिसिपेशन ऑफ द फेयर एंड द विजिटर्स इट विल ब्रिंग अलॉन्ग everyone prepares to live up to the sanctity of saying atithi devo bhav guests are next to god hence before the kumbh mela nothing can be left undone in the welcome of the guests this hospitality is not reserved for the known but for every pilgrim to kumbh mela this effectively reasserts indian society's venerable tradition of respecting human ties and the inexhaustible zeal to keep them alive in a world torn asunder by blatant individualism that fragments families and throws one into painful isolation the hallowed grounds of kumbh mela can be learning grounds where individuals can resurrect belief in humanity and human relationships uh, this is a time when individuals merge in the whole and the reason why uh, the kumbh can be transformative is because normally we remain uh, locked in our own shell of bodies uh, thinking only about our own personal problems anxieties and issues but when you are a part of a very large a flow of uh, people of humanity that's when you also find security and comfort in the multitude uh, it's a extraordinary experience and um, this is the reason why this has regenerated generations of people in india as well as abroad those who have been lucky to come down and be a part of it for centuries and thousands of years 
Sanatan Dharma places great value on charity or daan. And at the Kumbh Mela, daan is performed at a scale that is astonishing. It's not only the largest of the wealthy, but the small yet valuable contributions from the poor that help in hosting this massive undertaking. In Sanatan Dharma, it's not the size but the purity of intent that makes a daan of worth. Here, daan is performed with clear intentions and open-heartedness without the shadow of an ulterior motive or religious conversion. It is performed to extend help, not serve a hidden agenda. It is not in the nature of Hindus to advertise their charity in numbers or statistics. It's a good deed quietly done without fanfare or publicity. But if ever the statistics were to be collated, they would astound us. The other more visible and recognizable work of charity would perhaps pale in comparison. In Sanatan Dharma, selfless service or seva is for self-realization, not at all for religious conversion. At the Kumbh Mela, the spirit of seva is evident everywhere. In the unending supplies at the feeding tents, where all are humbly requested to partake of the offering and to visit again, Dan Dakshina is given to saints and seers in the effusive and generous hospitality accorded to every visitor. <laughs> In spite of its many redeeming and unique qualities, Hinduism often has been charged guilty of casteism. Yet, the Kumbh Mela stands as a visible testimony to the contrary. Here, the fair is for all, be it the feeding tents, visits to temples, dips in holy rivers or being in the tutelage of saints. All participate, all are welcome. This is social inclusiveness at its best. People also visit saints looking at their knowledge and austerity, despite of identifying their caste. Everybody from any class of life, from anywhere in the world, can come and take bath together. I mean, it's not like when you're taking bath in the Kumamela that you notice that there's this caste or that caste or this class of people or this, you know, level of uh, people. It doesn't matter. You're all taking bath in the same water. You're all getting along. You're all undergoing the same austerities. Uh, the crowd is pushing you as much as anybody else. It's all the same. It is very unfortunate that social harmony of Sanatan Dharma displayed at Kumbh is never highlighted by people involved in propaganda business. Kumbh Mela is an open invitation to the world to witness social harmony prevalent in Hinduism. The Kumbh Mela, along many other things, is an economic treatise. In ancient India, organization of fairs, festivities and pilgrimages was a proven method to keep the wheels of economy well oiled. This is because such events provided plenty of opportunity to create avenues of employment. It is a great economic booster when people travel from north to south, from east to west and crisscross, and when they travel in large numbers, then there is a big economic turnover. Though this angle of Kumbh Mela has not been thoroughly researched yet, it is easy to presume that the Kumbh Mela being a massive venture lasting over months, plenty of employment opportunities would surface here benefiting big and small tradesmen, artists, artisans, farmers. Across the world, cultural and economic growth is seen as mutually contradictory or at best misaligned. But in India, there has always been a healthy and symbiotic relationship between the two. Over the ages, kings and emperors and wealthy businessmen have patronized the arts and invested heavily in them. Thus, as the arts flourished, the culture blossomed. Economic recession never plagued this land.
Kumbh Mela is a gigantic platform on which multicultural India's diverse art forms and folk traditions are showcased to an enthralled audience. Artists from the length and breadth of the country meet, mix and mingle. Thus, art grows, spreads and thrives. Planning and organizing an event as diverse as Kumbh Mela is no mean task. Observers are often in disbelief at what goes into this exercise. Every few years, after astrological calculations, a location is selected and within days a temporary city arises like a hulking giant, ready to engorge the millions who will visit it. This city within city has a lifespan of merely a month and this month its citizenry is in millions. At the end of the month, it quickly dissolves with a silent promise that it will rise again at another location to reveal the mystery that is the Kumbh Mela. This temporary citadel of sorts is a study in hospitality. An example would be the city of Ujjain that hosted the Kumbh Mela in 2016. A rather small city of a population of 5 lakh hosted a mind-boggling 5 crore visitors an unbelievable 100% greater than its population. It staggers the world to imagine that such a mammoth exercise can be executed with near flawless finesse. The perfect tuning of the efforts of the government and administration and religious social organizations is an example of robust administration, mutual collaboration and deep understanding of India. It is an opportunity for the management professionals to explore that with amalgamation of traditional methods, common sense and modern technology, how India creates an entire new world. In fact, the gathering at Kumbh Mela has always busted many established Western principles. Western principles related to the psyche and behavior of crowd all collapse like a pack of cards. कुंभ को जो है मैंने बहुत नजदीक से इस बार देखा तो मैंने यहाँ भी एक ऐसी भीड़ देखी और ये देख के मैं बहुत हथप्रभ भी रहा बहुत अभिभूत भी हुआ कि ब्रायन जैन कहते थे द क्राउड इज अनट्रूथ भीड़ जो है वो असत्य है और यहाँ मैंने जो है एक सत्यान्वेषी किस्म की भीड़ देखी जो कि आई ही थी इस उद्देश्य से कि मनुष्य के भीतर का जो सत्य है मनुष्य के भीतर और षष्टि के भीतर जो समाया हुआ एक जो परमात्मा है एक जो परम सत्य है a cursory glance at the crime rate during the Kumbh Mela month reveals shocking statistics. The percentage of number of crimes dropped miraculously. In spite of the countless opportunities there would be in the ocean of humanity. Indian, Indian state and the Indian society, it, is a, it, is, it, has, it has maintained itself because the Indian people are self-regulated, self-regulated. And the greatest example of self-regulation is a Kumbh Mela, is a Kumbh Mela, where millions of people get together. You don't need policemen. There are no criminal activities. There is no violence. And, you know, days and days on and days on, there is complete order. The old people are, you know, given the chance to bathe first. In fact, some young people carry the old people on their back and, you know, give them a bus. So it's a great instance of self. One wonders, is it godly intervention? Is it the purity that wafts through the Kumbh Mela? Millions of people take their food and drinking water during the Kumbh. But there have not been major reports of ill health. Temporary sanitation facilities are set up for the lakhs who visit. Forget an outbreak of epidemic. Even minor illness is a rarity. In fact, this phenomenon continues to baffle the world, especially medical science. The answer lies in India's ancient and unique enunciation of clean and unclean, pure and impure. Cleanliness here goes beyond the absence of anything dirty. It also goes beyond mere hygiene. Roughly, it means a state or condition cleansed of anything that sullies or soils. 
a condition not limited to surroundings or the body, but extending to the mind, the heart and the soul. The Kumbh Mela is truly an amazing event the world gets to witness. But it has also been the victim of misinterpretation and misrepresentation. Uh, Westerners find Kumbh Mela very difficult to understand. And there is nothing of such enormous scale that they've ever had, nothing of so much diversity. Uh, because no, you know, all the dharmic traditions, paramparas, all the jatis, all the from north, south, east, west, everybody comes. And so they've never had such an open architecture of society in the West where it could be literally open to, to all sorts of people. They've had a very centralized a church authority in a certain institution. Uh, and so Kumbh Mela doesn't have, there's no headquarters of Kumbh Mela. There's no sort of uh, event manager. There's no, you know, these kind of thing, controller and controlling ent entity, head office of uh, Kumbh Mela that controls it. So this, these are some of the qualities of Kumbh Mela which are so unique that uh, Westerners can just look at it as uh, with awe. And they can look at it as some amazing thing, some kind of a myth. Maybe it's a carnival or a festival. Uh, maybe it's something very exotic. But they cannot really understand it the way Indians are able to feel very comfortable with. Misconception regarding Kumbh Mela are the outcome of erroneous understanding of Indian civilization and its worldview itself. It views life in its entirety, not through the narrow lens of cold reason or irrational logic. It refuses to dissect life into airtight compartments. It sees life as a continuum and hence its worldview is holistic rather than fragmented. This worldview helps to enrich all aspects of life and motivates towards higher goals called Dharma, Arth, Kama and Moksha. The Kumbh Mela is grand manifestation of Indian view, which perceives the human life in physical, intellectual and spiritual form and offers environment to nourish all forms of life. The Kumbh Mela is a flag bearer of an ancient yet ever-evolving philosophy, a philosophy that endows sublimity and purity in each of nature's creation, a philosophy that goes beyond a simplistic definition of life. It strives to probe deeper and extract the true meaning of life. It extols the profundity of life and also its innocence. Kumbh Mela can be termed a mirror image of an ancient civilization where knowledge was revered, where conscience was the ultimate arbitrator, where life got an opportunity to grow and expand unfettered and untarnished, mere logic would not suffice to truly understand and appreciate the Kumbh Mela. It requires a patient eye and a yearning heart. It involves an empathetic understanding of the process of maturation of civilizations and also the insight about the deeper and complex relationship between the individual and the society. Kumbh Kari Le Kumbh Bhari Le Dhan Dhan Hoi Jai Re Par 
परम ज्ञानी परम ज्ञानी अमर तू हा झलकाय अरे कुंभ करी ले कुंभ भरी ले धन धन हुई जाय रे परम ज्ञानी परम ज्ञानी अमर तू हा झलकाय रे कांकर पाथर जीव जनावर नदी झाड़ सब एक है कर पाथर जीव जनावर नदी झाड़ सब एक है बस है सभी में एक प्राण सुन अलग अलग बस रूप है यही तत्व का अंतर दर्शन कुंभ में लकर वाय रे धन धन हुई जाए रे जब सब नदिया नहीं आन मिले जब कुंभ मेला बुलवाए रे धन धन हुई जाए रे धन धन हुई जाए रे